Do I have a pen? Oh, yeah. Okay, how many first? So for SP, we are the leading energy company in Asia Pacific. We have business in China, Australia, and Singapore. In Singapore, mainly we are a transmission company. And for SP, I think we are asset rich. So these are some of the assets that we have. We have batteries, PV, PV means solar panels around the island. Uh, we are also rolling out charging stations or charging points around the island. We have tr transformer substation. We have a network infrastructure wireless connection where you can talk from meter to meter. So IoT devices is also something that we focus a lot on. We have all the analog meters as well as smart meters. We have a troop of meter men who go around do meter readings. We also have a troop of customer service officer. And then a lot of the money comes from transmission. So we have deep pockets for innovation. And I think this is one of the reasons why we are all here in a way. All these assets are layered by a suite of products that we built in SP Digital and it all contributes to all our revenues and key targets. Next. So you are in SP Digital. We are mostly product owners, software developers, designers. We have data scientists and IoT engineers in this space. It's about 120 people. It is headed by Nicknamed the code father of Singapore, Sao Xiong. So apparently, if you are an engineer, you probably know him. And apparently, if he asks you to join SP Group, then you shouldn't say no. If not, your career is doomed. <laughs> That's the rumor. <laughs> <laughs> Our mission is in sustainability. And when I say sustainability, people will be ah, green, you know, talk about saving the world. In, in a sense, when I started, I was questioning this goal as well because it seems very ambiguous. But now it's one and a half years into SP and I really realized that they are true to the mission. Everything that we do has ties to sustainability. In energy tech, right, it is very specific to energy system. So if you are talking about sustainability when you are in a food industry, then you are talking about carbon emission for farming and agriculture culture and so on. But in energy tech, it is really about creating a system that can meet current demand without compromising the future generation's energy needs. And this is some of Singapore's sustainability goals. It's not very public, but we do have sustainability goals to you know, the glo global community. Next. In SP Digital, we are mainly in the business of creating digital products. And our main audience are residential customers commercial and industrial customers, and also nationwide rollout. Next. So this is one of a global portal that we have. Through SP Digital, we created a blockchain renewable energy certificate marketplace. This means that you can buy renewable certificates from anywhere in the world. And this is one of the ways where our organization here can become green. And through this blockchain marketplace, happy to announce, the SP Group is currently 100% sustainable, even though we don't have renewables in Singapore. Next. Um, this is an example of commercial and industrial projects where we are helping buildings such as this building to optimize their energy consumption as well as provide insights and transparency towards where they are spending and so on. We are also deploying solar system on the rooftops so that they can get renewable energy. And then finally, I think this is some, something that more people are familiar with, which is our SP Utilities app. So within SP Utilities app, we are also rolling out things that are more sustainable, such as in this year, you are expecting energy tips. You can expect more insights because we have smart meters, finally. So with smart meters, you are able to see your consumption by every half hour. So this gives you more insights about your consumption. And then, of course, one of the new things we are rolling out is EV charging. So for UX designers, we always believe that the people is what, what we are designing for. And the problems are what we are trying to provide solutions for. And to do this, right, there are some principles that we need in not only SPD, but SP Group. And I'm very happy to say, I think this is my biggest win last year, is to provide guiding principle for whole SPD. And we only have two guiding principles that is quite easy to remember. One is that we always need to be consumer-centered. And this means creating products and services to solve the right problems. 
How it manifests is whenever we talk about new features or new products, we always ask who the users are. So when the product owners come to us with a new request, this is what we ask them, who, who are your users? Is it building managers or is it consumer? Is it residents? Is it finance manager and so on? What is the problem that you're trying to solve? And how will this problem or product feature or user story solve that problem? And then second guiding principle that we are always data driven because if there's no data to back out your opinions, it is merely your opinion. It becomes a preference, like your preference against my preference, and this will go on and on. So how this manifests, it will manifest as which matrix are we trying to change. By doing this feature, what will happen to this certain matrix? This is the process that we use, the lean cycle or, or agile. We start with learn. If it's an existing product, we might start with measure. So it, it doesn't matter where you start, as long as you have a cycle that happens fast enough. So for learn, we are talking about quantitative and qualitative research, which Nanning will then talk into detail. For build, we have design systems. We have a set of guidelines for designers to collaborate together so that we are faster and we are also consistent. And for measurement, um, we have with Jean, who will tell us how we measured and tagged uh, the products properly so that we can always tie it back to our objective right from the beginning. With that, I will move on to the workshop. So now I'm going to bring you through on how we typically start a new feature. So uh, we want to get everyone on the same page. So in the typical product roles, uh, product team, they are the business owners, product owners, designers, and developers. So depending on the requirements of the project or the feature, we'll bring other roles such as the QA, data scientists, or even the customer service. Because each of them actually brings in different perspectives, and uh, they might have a different understanding of the problems that we're trying to solve. So it's very important to get alignment in terms of the problem that we're tackling and also on the solutions. So how we do it is we will start off with a two hour design workshop. So the design workshop is typically broken down into two parts. For the first part, we call it the start. So, uh, so we will try to understand, get clarity and alignment uh, of the problem or the business objective and Next, we will do the sketching. So this is the part where we get people to write down their ideas, brainstorm, do crazy aids, do the storyboarding. The idea is to get the ideas out from their mind into something tangible, okay, something they can share with everyone. Then lastly, we will do the prioritization of the solutions through a democratic way. So we will, get, we will give them stickers and they will vote on them. So after the, based on the, the stuff that's voted, we will then do the prototype. So the prototype will fall on the second day where we will also come up with the user research interview plan. So on the third day, we will conduct the user research interview based on the prototypes that we created on the second day. And this is where we will go out, test the users that we have pre-recruited before the workshops. Then we will analyze the findings and share with everyone. So now we need to, so uh, just to give you an example on the problem space. So let's say for example, the business owner or product owner will come in and say, I want to achieve 8 million revenue by the end quarter for 2019. And I want to have uh, $8 money average revenue per user, APU. Then uh, the business owners and um, PO will also come up with the success metrics in order to measure on the goals. And this is what we call a user story or payment. So if you recall what Priscilla has mentioned earlier, just now she was talking about the sustainability direction the SP is going towards. So this could be a fitting problem statement. Like for example, as a residential customer, I want to be rewarded for my green contribution so that I feel appreciated. So to help the participant understand better, we actually guide them through 
the user journey so if you can take a look at your table yeah so we have a copy of the user journey of what the current users are going through so i just uh, briefly going to highlight over here so it's, so for the start it's a seed process where as a user i want or as a consumer right i want to find electricity i want to buy so i will go and find out where i can sign up then after that i will pick the options so the signing up process could be maybe through the app, through the website, or through the customer service center. After that, I'll be onboarded, and maybe they'll receive a new mail, or they will receive an email or SMS to tell them they are switched on. Uh, then after that, you will be using it. So while using, you want to monitor your usage. So at the end of the month, you will receive the bill, and you will try to pay. And how you pay? Maybe through the app, through 7 Eleven, or through other channels. Then uh, depending on whether your experience is positive or negative, you will want to share with your friends or family. Then lastly, the relationship will terminate when they uninstall the app or they close the account. So uh, in order to help the participants, we also try to narrow down the target users. So here are just uh, some of the personas that we identified for our users. So in SPD, we mainly focus on the cautious, conscious, proactive, and the easy solution seekers because they represent the majority of our users. Okay. So now that we have identified and aligned with the problem space, we will move on to the solution space. So here are some photos of our workshops. So uh, here you can see uh, we are getting participants uh, from the various teams, various roles, right, to come in to get alignments of the problem they are trying to solve. And uh, over here, you can see that the sketches are actually placed on the windows over here. So the participants can go around the room and they actually can use the stickers to vote on it. So once uh, the votes are, the ones with the most vote, we will create a prototype. Uh, next. So here's a sample of the prototypes that are created based on the most voted one. And we'll make it into an interactive version. So then we will pass it on to the user research researcher we will test it out with the users. Okay, now I'll hand it over to Nanning to talk more about the learning process. Okay, so basically, the in the terms mic, of sorry, the mic. Oh yes, I'm sorry. <coughs> 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 like this, ah? Uh? Okay, can. Okay. So basically, in terms of research, um, as you as you all should have known, I guess user experience encompasses the whole experience end to end um, from the user, um, from its services and then all of the products. So um, I guess in terms of research, the most uh, the value of the research itself, I guess it's um, it's uh, a direct feedback from the users uh, without any agenda from everyone. I guess that's my role as a researcher over here, not only doing the research but as well evangelizing the data and the importance of having a user um, into the product development process. So basically why we do UX research, um, we do first one we try to get user behavioral insights um, so we always go back into previous or existing experience of the users and then we try to prioritize features so my role as well is to help um, to support the product team um, to um, help them prioritizing features for their roadmap and then when once we have the designs so let's say the designs that is produced from the design sprint or the, any designs that came in from the designers um, i will try to evaluate the usability of those designs um, so the research that we do, um, so I myself, I do more on qualitative, um, we didn't do more on quantitative, Crystal works on most of uh, both qualitative and quantitative. Um, and then basically qualitative and quantitative, even though it serves a um, different purpose, it's supposed to be working each other, it's supposed to be complementing each other. Um, and then, yeah, go next. So if we go back into the lean cycle, um, we do learn, build and measure. So during learn, which is the very initial process, we're trying to inspire ourselves, we're trying to explore and then choose new directions and opportunities. This is where we do both qualitative and quantitative. We look into um, past user interviews, we will look into surveys, um, we will conduct new user interviews as well. Um, and then once we come up with the designs, either from design sprints or maybe from the designers as well, we will try to inform ourselves and optimize the designs to reduce risk and improve visibility. This is where we do mainly qualitative. Um, and then once we've launched the product, once we've 
um, release the product, we will try to measure the product performance against itself or against its competitors, which I think that's where region would um, dig in a bit deeper on. So um, I actually haven't updated the slides, but um, these are a very small subset of the users that we've talked to so far. Um, usually we conducted the user interview about five to seven people every each round. Um, so after this, I'll run you through the process of planning a user interview. No, actually, we do a lot more um, research methodologies, but it's just like I guess user interview is the most um, the most uh, knowledge or insights that we can get with the least effort. So which is why in um, SPD we do a lot more S uh, user interview other than um, other methodologies. So after this, we will I will run you through the process of planning user interviews and then analyzing user interviews and reporting a uh, user interview. So um, during user once we <coughs> sorry during a planning a user interview, um, we will con these are the things that usually will be included. So objectives, methodologies, um, timeline and schedule, um, including recruiting as well. Questions and tasks. Um, what are the questions that we want to ask? What are the designs that will be included in this research? And then who are the people that we are talking to? What are the targeted users? As in, like we can't just recruit any users from anywhere. As in, we're supposed to have a target users that go back or refer back into the persona that we have um, so which is why um, usually we always have this and then basically this is to identify um, whether the research is meant for a discovery research or is it more for usability research um, and then as well to shape the conversation with the user and then to avoid scope creep so how we structure the user interview usually we structure it into this um, uh, five act interview which is welcome discovery so accessibility, rank concepts, and debrief. So welcome is a, is a, the overarching objective, which is trying to gain trust from the users because we're trying to get um, trust as much as possible, trying to make the user as comfortable as possible with us so that we can get as much as insight as possible from them. And then during discovery, we're trying to gain um, discovery insights, um, which is referring back to um, their existing behavior or their past experience. And then we will test you the usability of the designs that we have and then once we have uh, multiple concepts, we'll try to rank the concepts because qualitative is not a good way to validate the value proposition, but at least it's a good way to gauge between each of the concepts that we have. So yeah, next I will have a quiz. Um, so I, sh I was supposed to print this, but yeah. Um, basically, I have um, Amazon page over here. Um, which is a product page. So there's a, there's a product page and then there's the details, there's, there's add to cart. There's um, recommendation um, section. So I will have questions, and then I want you to guess whether these are good questions or these are bad questions. Okay. What do you think this is? What do you think about this question? Sorry? Maybe who thinks is a good question? Oh, okay. Yeah. What okay. This one first. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, but what do you think about this question? So this is used during like. Testing. Yep. Okay, so basically this question, okay, go on. Yeah, this is a good question because this is uh, this will reveal the first impression of the of the page. So usually this is the first question that we ask the user when we show the designs. We want to see whether the user actually get um, the the page, whether they understand what page is this, and then any first impression that comes out from um, from when when the users see the designs. And then next one, would you buy the products that are recommended? Any of you think this is a good question? Okay, if you think this is a bad question, why do you think this is a bad question? Would there be a follow up question to this? Or is it just this then? Uh, no. But what do you think about this question? If it's done alone, I don't think it's a good question. But oh. if there's a follow up, why then maybe it's a good one? Okay. Any other opinion? It's a, for me, it means a close-ended question. Okay. Um, secondly, usually, usually when you ask people whether they will buy, they cannot really, they don't really predict their actual behavior. Correct. So yeah, actually, this is a bad question because this is assuming that the user will use the recommended section to buy the item, and it is assuming that the next thing the user will do is actually adding the item to the cart. Um, Okay, next one. Yeah, it's supposed to be what would you do next. So usually once we um, show the designs and then we will ask to them what would you do next to see 
what is the natural um, reaction from the user that they would do once they see this design or they see the page. What about if you want to add to cart, which one would you click? What do you think about this question? Bad. Why? You keep the clues away. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, this question assumes the next thing the user will do is um, adding the item to the cart. So yeah, it's supposed to be what we should do next. Um, last two. What other information do you want to see in this page? What do you think about this question? Okay, so yeah, um, <laughs> I think, yeah, um, we believe that this is actually a good question because this will reveal opportunities and content um, that we should add on the page. What other information that is needed? Um, what other information that is needed from the user to make a decision for the next step that they would do? Um, and then last one, how many times a month do you go to this website? What do you think about this question? Why do you think it's a bad question? Yes. Okay, perfect. Yes. Actually, it's bad because it's easier to recall his or her experience, uh, past experience, rather than estimating the occurrence. So uh, I think for this one, it's much better to ask how many times this month or maybe this week um, do you go to this website. Usually, you will try to limit them into at least um, past three months because I guess um, more than three months is not a reliable answer from the user. So once we do the user interview, um, we will collect them, them into a spreadsheet. So in the spreadsheet, usually we will put the names on the top and then we will put the questions on the left. So the first thing that we usually do is that we will try to clean up the data first because every user would have different ways on telling the answers. Um, so we're trying to summarize the answers without, without uh, changing the insights, just to make it easier to compare between each of the columns. <coughs> And then sometimes I would do it by myself, but actually this is also, we believe this is also a good way to bring other stakeholders into the process. So we would um, put all the summary into the, what is it, into the board using the post-its. So each of the post-its actually is color coded for each of the users. Um, and then it will be something like this. So the questions is in the purple one. And then these are the, these are the questions. And then the green ones are the patterns or the insights um, that we can get based on the um, answers. So when we do reporting, um, we do we include introduction, uh, findings, design changes, and summary. And then the introduction actually is a very crucial time, a very crucial section to um, set the stage, um, trying to tell the audience why you should listen to this report um, and what are the objective of this research. Um, so basically, usually we would put like the research objectives, and then we would put the assets that we use. Um, and then what we have done so far, we will show the users as well without showing their names and profile. So usually like for in this case, we will put like what are their jobs and then like the background and then we will put their um, electricity retailer that they use. <coughs> and then usually we sh this is how we show the data as well. Um, we will have the key findings and then we will have the supporting data, eh, the data to support these uh, key findings. So if it's qualitative, usually we will try to make it as visual as possible and then we will put some quotes from the user to make it way stronger, uh, to make it stronger um, to the audience. If it's quantitative data, we usually will show more graphs and charts. Um, if the user say anything about the competitors, um, usually we will try to dig in more into the competitors and then see um, what is there and then like why is it better, why is it um, not better. And then <coughs> Showing the design changes or any insights related to the designs, I think that's the most crucial part into this, um, any uh, user interview or usability testing as well. So usually we will show the before and after and then we will show what, which parts that uh, we change and then why we change it, which feedback um, relates to the design components. Um, and then after that, we will come up with a summary and recommendation, which I can't show you the uh, screenshot over here. <laughs> and then, but basically, usually it would consist of the findings, which we would try to um, give as neutral as possible, not giving any recommendations. Um, so it's clearly based on the user feedback. And then after that, when we show the recommendations, uh, the, tools to, the tools and ways to get there.
then after that we will go on with the design okay. Okay, so the next step of the whole lean process is design, which is called build as well. Um, for the designer here, we work very closely with the researcher like Naning and Weijin to get insight on the actual user problem and because it's always about users, right? Um, okay, have you been into a restaurant, right? Like you order the bar chow mee in the morning and another bar chow mee at night, but somehow it tastes slightly different. Then you will wonder why is it the taste consistency is not there. And let's say you have a chance to look into the kitchen and you realize that, oh, this morning they are using this particular black sauce, but and then the other person who cooking on it is using another kind of black sauce. So it sort of doesn't make much sense and make the taste different. So all these chefs that they try to prepare their own ingredients or their own recipe, although the end goal is trying to create the best bar chow mee, but somehow they taste differently. And resulting, not a very good result, and end up maybe I won't go back there to eat again. So take the same scenario in a design team. How do we ensure that all the designers have the same style or developing the same design in a sense like drawing the same pictures <laughs> so to unite the whole design team here we would like to have a very common visual language in terms of typography layouts grids colors icon and components even coding convention voice and tone should be the same how do we know that we have successfully have a common language? During a design discussion, right? let's say we stop using something called, oh, this should be a dark grey, this should be a light grey, but instead we use a terminology, let's say, this should be a paper colour, this should be a soap. That's our naming convention for our colour. Then we know that this whole common language visual system is working for the whole team, including the engineers. So taking back the same kitchen analogy from just now, the ingredient is like an element and the site is a component and the final dish is a template. This is something a little bit similar to the atomic design but we somehow twist it a little bit because here we always, it's always about efficiency and agility. Um, let's say we have the same ingredients always prepared in the bank or in the library and we can take it to make the same french fries which is the site and which is, in this case in a UI way is a component and then the complete dish is a template so this template can be customized based on whatever the story or the concept we are trying to create later on like for example your mac chicken can be a corn or not a fries or I can have double and I don't want mayo sauce um, in terms of our design system in SPD, we call it Lumi, Lumi Kit. Why we call it Lumi is actually the full name is Luminaire. It means it to illuminate, just like powering up the power. And we short form it, call it Lumi. And all our resource or style guide is stored inside uh, InVision Design System like Manager. So all the designers can collaborate tightly or contribute to it. We see this as uh, a living product instead of a one-off team like the old school. I know a lot of software company that come up with style guide, which is very tedious to update. And I think this works very best for all the designers in the team, uh, even the engineers. Um, the style guide is part of the whole system. We, had, we have various different colors, buttons, states, typography, even units or different types of icon in the whole uh, system. I can show you how roughly our, our 
working file is. Just get to the. Hmm. Where is it? Where is it? So this is the system we have. Right. You can see that we actually categorize all of them very neatly. So when every time after a workshop, it's very easy for us to pick and choose to create new components or elements out of it. And lots of times that um, our our concept actually includes icon. We have already uh, sorry charts. So we have already preset like different types of bar chart or line chart or even pie chart in the whole system, which any designers can and use it straight away. And this is for the web portion. So back to the slides. Um, aside of all this style guide, because sometimes we want to be a little bit, a little bit more expressive with our concept or ideas, we also have. Uh, we just created this this year. We have an illustration library which we define certain uh, different types of illustration we want to use across our products. So we have like example. This is what we call the spots, which is more a systematic. Explanation of a certain feature, for example, your error, your success or failure type of illustration, and we also have a preset of different profile of characters in the library, which can be pick and choose quickly. For like onboarding or different type of more conceptual kind of uh, message we're trying to deliver, we have uh, something called a scene. So for scene, it's something richer that or something. More than a message that we're trying to deliver to the user, so it's some sort of a story. Maybe you explain the merlion. Okay, let me explain the merlion. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Can can you guys tell me uh, what is this illustration trying to say? Can I see? Let me zoom in. Uh. Can zoom in? Yeah, I think you can zoom in. It's cool too. Huh? Yeah. Okay, I open the sketch file. <laughs> we do it the the design way. In where? Go to sketch file. In in Google Library. Okay. Okay. Zoom in more. Zoom in more. It's very big, really. <laughs> okay. Can you guys roughly tell what the this illustration is telling? Hydropower. <laughs> Hydropower. So okay, one we have hydropower. What? Any other guesses? How Malayan was built? Okay. This is like primary school science, like primary from kinetic energy to electrical and energy. Okay, it's close. It's close. Then to something else, ah. Is it about the electrical energy? I thought it's like after you cycle, then you have some water coming out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Like it's powered by humans. You mean like you, you cycle and then you, you and then you produce water. Not <laughs> energy, energy. To pay for the pump, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Then that water can water flow. Oh, water flow. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, it's. And in front of Marina Bay. Okay, let me re let me <laughs> let me review. Let me. Okay, so I think you guys got. Yeah, I think you guys got seven, sixty percent correct. So when we're trying to create uh, this illustration, for SP, their their main message is powering up the nation. So, Merlion actually represents Singapore, and we have the SP serviceman, which is using the sustainable way to ge generate power and powering up the Merlion. Yeah. Then we have electricity and water. Yes. Nice. Then we got lights. Ah. 
<laughs> okay. So with the standardization of components, right, it allows our designer to sort of collaborate more. Because I know like for you guys, like a particular designer will be leading a certain products, right, which uh, limit the chance of working on the other product. So with our library, we are able to do design pairing in SPD. Um, how it, it's something like the engineer code pairing, but it allows to have quick bounce of idea or freshest perspective to whatever idea we try to develop. So in this case, I was working with Yang to come up with some new ideas what, or feature that I'm working on. Yeah, uh, I'll pass to Weijing on the measure. Thank you, Petra. <coughs> okay, this is the last part. Okay, measure the third part. Everywhere good la. <laughs> <laughs> All right, measure the third part of the lean cycle, the stage whereby we measure and understand if our product or feature works or not. So. Uh, did it steer the user in the direction that we expect them to be with the new features? So I guess you guys are not strangers to measurement. More often which you guys come along with measurement on a day-to-day -day basis like ROI, growth rate, or different touch points and all the conversion rates. And all those, all those things will come in hand with the business decision making process, whether you can roll out with this feature or not. So as for product, we also do the same thing we will measure all the touch point whereby our customers and our uh, our customers have touch points with our products and from all of those touch points we will allow our stakeholders and business owners to get informed decisions whether they should proceed on with the plan or they will pivot off away so I'd like to start with a little quiz I, I believe that everyone is on social media right so often which you will see ads like this. So this is an ad trying to drive uh, ticket sales towards a workshop. Anyone prefer option A? Show of hands. Me. Yeah. Me. Option B? Me. Okay. So option A will be better or option B will be better? Which one will drive more sales? A, B. A, B. Okay. So more often which the decision is quite hard to base just on limited information on the designs. How about I add in a little bit of measurement of numbers? Impressions is the number of time the ad is being shown and clicks is the number of time that users interact with the ad. So as of now, some of you guys might think, hey, actually the other one is better or not. So a lot of time with informations like this, we will get uh, allow us to make uh, information or decisions on how the ads are performing. So what I've shown is actually uh, vanity metrics, more often which they can't provide us guidance alone. So with a combination of impression and clicks comes something called actionable metrics whereby conversion rate allowing us to have a decision on which one to push more money into it, which is option A whereby the conversion rate is higher. So a statement that I believe in is if you don't measure it, you can't improve it. So measurement allow us to have a baseline of where we are now and how can we proceed or improve from there. However, there's a lot of moving part in the business, different departments and different parts. So with metrics and measurements, it allow us to focus on what other things to do first, what is more important first. So here are some good uh, characteristics of good metrics. Something that is comparable, something is understandable, something is a ratio or rate, percentage growth, increases downloads, and rate or ratio of 10% or 1 out of 10. So continuing on with the user uh, story. So as a residential customer, I want to be rewarded with my green contribution. So I feel appreciated. So during the design sprint, we also uh, sit down with the PO 
to break down what are the metrics that they want to measure with this feature. So appreciation can go all the way down to conversion rate, whereby they are using it, they feel appreciated. Or green contribution is involvement and how engaged are they on this feature within the app. So I would like to have a quick demo on the tools that we are using. <laughs> Uh, sorry, we can't really show you the actual performance of our app, so I'll just use a sample one. So this GA, and uh, this is reading off uh, Google Merchant Store. So what we have now is, uh, sorry, just quick check. Do you guys use GA? Yes. yes. So, as in, you're, you use GA to measure your app, or is it a web? I thought GA is more web. Both. 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 Yes. So for app, okay. So since you guys know that I don't really need to run too much into GA. So for as of now, we are using Firebase uh, for our app. So you're also piping into GA, but the sad thing is they are going to sunset this year. So now we are in the midst of transiting out for the app portion, but the web portion, we are still using GA for it. Okay, uh, so no need demo. Okay, so usually GA, uh, Firebase, it allows us to know what the users are behaving and what are they uh, interacting within the app. But for okay, but for user journey, usually we don't just look at the app itself. We look at the whole journey. So uh, as you can see on the table, we have the user journey map for our consumers. So that is being mapped back to the flow metrics, which uh, is created by uh, venture capitalist Dave McClell. So with a five portion of different touch point of where the users will interact with the product, acquisition, activation, retention, revenue, or referral. In our case, we also call it growth as well. Yeah. So I would like to have a, ex a sample of how the flow metrics will work with our products, sample, sample products. So this is a typical life cycle of a mobile app. It can be SP UTP apps, or it can be Carousel or it can DBS, Payla, Grab, Facebook, Instagram, or any popular apps or favorite apps within your mobile phone. So usually for a user, they will just browse the app store, they like it, they install, they use, they don't like it, then they just did it away. But for product owners, usually we will follow the process of how the user go from the first step through the app store, all the way down to engagement and uh, churn so they will measure like something like activation rate, engagement rate. If the user do not like it, they will go churn. And at the stage of process of disengaging, there are also many campaigns. There are ma many startups that run hacks to get reactivations to get users back to engage on the app. If they don't like it, then you go to uninstall. Then they also on the left side, there is uh, retention. So people with viral code efficiency, reviews and ratings. So from my understanding, algorithm with review and ratings will be impact on how popular or how likelihood your app will get featured within the App Store. The second part, Marketplace. I think this is in your realm mm -hmm. for Carousel. So uh, users coming in, buyer sellers, then they will have a transaction inside. So something interesting is the percentage of blank search. So uh, we also can measure how satisfied the users are, if they can search for their things, or if blank search re return results is high, so the, users, uh, the, buy uh, the buyers can't find what they want to buy, most likely they will go to other platforms or other marketplace to purchase their item. And as for after they have transact on the web page or on the, on the platform, you'll move down uh, to disengage or they'll just repeat. So. Um, I would like to ask if you guys have anything that you guys measure that is out of this template marketplace chart that's being shared across. Yeah. Yes. Just ask the I think this is this is this uh this framework has a lot to do with like the performance of the. Marketplace. Mm. I think on Carousel we also monitor quite a bit of like things like safety. Um, so that is something that we, we have other models oh. to, to measure. Um, like, uh, 
although like y'all keep hearing like Carol Hell or like uh, online crime like spike because of Carousel. Uh, but actually truth, truth to be told, these are, uh, when, when we look at the real numbers, they are really like a fraction of the percentage of the platform, given the volume that we have every day. So of course, you know, like when things increase, uh, I mean like the SPF might, uh, might report as a 138% increase uh, in uh, online scams. But uh, they didn't know like uh, correspondingly how many percentage of uh, transactions and uh, user growth that we have on our platform. Yeah. That definitely outpaced the, the growth of the uh, scammers. Or so so they, 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 we, we track those things separately because oh. actually trust is a very, very strong fundamental for our marketplace. Mm -hmm. yeah, we only wish that more people know. Yeah, and other than that, because we, we start to think about how to monetize, so a lot of time we um, we also measure like revenue and also like how how um, if there is ad portion, how do we uh, how do we measure the impact of each clicks or like views, make it into money money value. So that's also things that we we start to measure more and more. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Cool. All right. So I think with all this measurement coming in place. Um, Next, we also have to evangelize our information, not just letting the team know, and also other part of stakeholders within the, uh, within the uh, whole organization or within SPD itself. So what we have is also a weekly report to send out to business owner, product owners, developers as well, and it's also shared across the general chat across our SPD to let everyone know about how on a weekly basis how our app are performing, what's the number change, how does it impact, and with any new product rollout or new features rollout, does it shift the needle based on what our KPIs are? And what we also have is also a dashboard whereby it's located right uh, beside the business owners. In the past, whereby we have our stand-ups, it's, uh, it's, it's right next to it. So uh, everyone in the team will know with the new features and new rock, does it shift the needle? Does it impact what has done by the team? Does it improve or does it work towards the goal of what we are looking for? So with that, I'll, I'll wrap it up. Is we always start with people, designing for, and design for efficiency and measure the outcome using the lean process. Thank you very much. All right. Yeah, we can open the floor for Q and A. Okay, uh, right now it's four fifty. Then we will bring the sake out. Yeah. <laughs> sake. Okay, so. <laughs> 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 yeah. Any questions from any of you? Anyone of the team? Yeah. Okay. okay. Oh, you asked uncle. No, no, no. I was said that actually bus uncle in that one also you asked. Yeah, yeah. He's one of the users that we interviewed. Oh, as a the developer himself or the... No, as a as a electricity consumer. Oh. <laughs> well, I thought you were asking the app itself. No, 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 no. no. Was, I, I just put over there because it's interesting. Any other questions? Yes. So I have one question. Uh, I saw that uh, you guys are using uh, InVision to manage your design system. Um, so I'm, I'm talking to them next week. Uh, so just <laughs> wanting to know like, what's your reviews and about the product. <laughs> <laughs> I think so far we're still in the exploration state. Uh, we do notice there are some limitations in terms of the stuff that we can customize. Like for example, if we want to have a breakdown of sections within our sections, right? We can't really do that right now with our system. Yeah. Because and the, I think because also right now, right, it's have we haven't even we haven't really involved the frying guys yet. Uh, it sort of serves as a start for the design team first. Yeah. Yeah. Question for uh, learning, yeah. right? So when you when you selected your users, like when you recruit them for yeah. your research, uh, how do you usually? What kind of criteria do you uh, create? Or is there a real case example that you can talk about? Uh, so I guess we always, uh, for consumer at least, we always go back into the personas that we have. We have um, actually the one that is on the wall there, Pang Lin and Robin, which is the conscious, proactive and um, easy solution seeker. 
Um, so we always make sure that there's a good combination on between the two. Uh, we look at their behavior. Um, so we define them based on their behavior, based on their uh, electricity usage, how they trying to manage the consumption of their electricity. Um, other than that, so we have we actually have a pool of users, um, which we can contact them anytime. We have about like fifty to sixty users right now. Um, and each of them, we have the data for um, their names and then their um, background, their job background, their houses, how many rooms in how many how many rooms each DB, what electricity usage do they use, um, how do they pay um, their electricity uh, bills and so forth. So we look into those data, um, and then the requirements for each of the user usually differs between each of the uh, each of the features. So like for example, um, we have a feature recently for open electricity market in our app, which you can actually browse um, electricity plans um, that is out there. Um, when we did the user interview for there, we trying to get not only SP users, so we trying to get electricity other electricity retailer users. Um, at the time, there was only Jurong area, um, and we trying to get people from Jurong that actually already use other electricity um, plants. So those are the a typical case. So usually um, we always go back to it. So the base one, usually we always go back to the two, um, but the requirements, the detail requirements usually we differ uh, based on project basis or product basis. Okay, I see. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, sorry, Keith. Just to add on to your question just now, right? Um, the other benefit of it is uh, it's in sync with Sketch. So mm -hmm. whatever you add to the library, right? Like let's say another designer want to pull the same component, it's exactly the same. I can pull it straight away from that library. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So it integrates quite well with Sketch. Mm. And in a way, I think it's quite intelligent. So like for fonts and text symbols, right? You add it in, they can recognize it, and they will show the relevant information uh, to the developers. Let's say what's the size, what is the the code, everything on DSN. Yeah. I have one question. Yes. So for the researcher yourself, yeah. after you've done the research and then you, you process the research mm -hmm. and then you pass it off to the designer yourself? Um, so okay. usually I don't wait until I finish all the reports. So okay. usually every time like there's um, an interview, uh, every time I do interview, usually I would go back, like during stand up or like go back to the office and then I'll tell, eh, that user is not like this design. Like I will go straight. Um, tell them so, but that just to update them like very very specific stuff that that we should uh, we should change. But once we finish like at least um, we finish clean up the data. Once we have um, the insights from the raw data before we go on into the report, usually I would run through the designers as well so that the designers can see the raw data and then they can give me some recommendations on what recommendation I should put on the report as well. Like they would tell me like, oh, I think you should change this. I think. Uh, we can add something like this because in terms of product design wise I think they're the ones who understand better on the product design and the strategy of the product uh, but yeah usually I will always keep them in the loop other than that um, these people they, they lead research as well and during our research um, they I'm trying to bring them into observe um, to my research so they try to listen to my research and they take note so they are most of the time they are aware of most of the interviews that we have without even me telling them anyway so yeah. yeah. Another question. Um, very uh, actually, I'm very interested in the design system stuff that you guys have. Um, so I'm looking at this just to uh, taking uh, had a sneak peek into the sketch file. Right, you know, the icons were actually quite limited. Uh, mm. But do you have a separate system to manage your icons? Then second question. Uh, then what about the illustrations? Do you have another system to uh, have a bank for the illustration? Okay. First question. <laughs> Actually, we just started it this year to evolve the whole system. Mm -hmm. That's why the actually the current icon on on the first sketch file I revealed just now, it's still sort of like a work in progress. And in terms of the second question, right, we actually able we have already break down different illustration into different category. So just like just now, right, there's already two. I think in the system we have. Four, four, four or five different categories. So first one is the, we call it scene, which is the merlion one, to talk about a more conceptual message or some sort of story that is very hard to portray or create through a certain UI kind of thing. Then the second one is we call spots. So 
so sports it's more straightforward it's more system driven interaction kind of uh, illustration and the third one we call it uh, feature icons which are icons in colors and the fourth one we call it UI icons which is what you saw on the first slide uh, like outlines and stuff this is how we break the illustration into four different groups I think to add on to your question right incidentally the icons that you see there is enough for us I don't think we use that many icons so it's enough um, to add to this point last year was all about validating the concepts and making sure that we solve some of the fundamental user problems and these are nothing to do with UI so for our UI it's quite basic and quite vanilla so but now I think this year we are looking more on the image and the branding and we have luxury of time so we are optimizing other things so, um, uh, can I clarify so the main, the main product that you guys are working on is the so we for have yeah. for residential it's the SP green app. We are creating now now it's in trend the super app. And then in there right there will be different features for different types of users. So we are going in uh, with E V. So for E V right it will be E V users and they might not have it to this account. E V is what? Electric vehicle. Oh, okay, okay. Right. So it's across the, the products are different because you know products. And then for CNI, there's a whole different suite of products. So we have um, building energy consumption management, we have EV management, we have battery management. So these are all different suite of products that is on the CNI side, which is invisible to the users, but it's also a huge chunk of our time. So to give you context, residential is like B2C, CNI, commercial industrial is like B2B mm. side of things. Yes. So, so for the whole, the, the whole screen, like how often do you uh, iterate uh, on those, the whole screen of product? Iteration is quite frequent, so monthly there will be improvement to all the features. Mm -hmm. There are also bigger launches like EV and Rec Marketplace and OEM. These are bigger launches. After launch, I think the next step will be iteration. So the EV charging that you see on the app right now is our MVP. There are things that are not in there, so the next version we will add in more things like map, for example, or more insights. Then um, for OEM, we also just launch it. So the new launch, we know that there are certain things that the users want that, but we haven't added there. So the next step of optimizer is to add it in. For I think it's very hard to tell you the context of our B two B product because we didn't show it here, and it is actually quite technical. But we can give you a brief overview later because you are also very interested in what you want to share. So after the whole session, maybe one on one we can show you our suite of B2B products. Yes. 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 So we have a very specific question about these slides. Uh, so you guys separate like the libraries on in the you know, site system manager for let's say for example like just out of uh, examples, right? Like Android and iOS. Do you separate your libraries like that or do you just have one massive library with everything very good question. It's all one active library. Yeah. And initially we have a lot of complaints from the iOS and Android. Like, oh no, it's different, blah, 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 blah. But then I think I will teach to them is that if you notice and you look at the um, HCI documentation and material design, they are copying off each other anyway and they're getting more and more similar. So with that trend, right, I think UI can be more similar and I think it's easier for them to see that. Years ago, they are completely different. So, native elements on iOS they will not be there on Android. But now, any elements you see on iOS is actually a common part for Android. They just name it differently, but it behaves the same. And then, um, we also I, I also had direct conversation with people on the like, material designing, and they are actually not so you know about your platform being very platform specific. They also know some of the limitations of material design. Then the other thing is we want to let the developers know that designers are actually on the trend defining stage. Whenever it goes into material design or HCI, it's actually out of trend already. So if you follow material design or um, Apple design closely, you realize that your app is going to just look like every other app. So it's very clean. But then if you, for us, you want to be more trend setting. So instead of looking at material design or iOS, we actually look at apps that we know are trend setting. So maybe your medium 
or your um, Instagram, for example. So I think in, in terms of interest of time, yeah. maybe we... Yeah. 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 Yeah.